Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast, Mr. Haas. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, would you like to introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Thank you. Yes, my name is Jeffrey Haas, and I uh, have been a civil rights lawyer since the late 60s. Uh, we started uh, after I graduated from the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, we started the People's Law Office in Chicago in the summer of 1969. At that point, the Chicago was the hotbed of, of much, many things going on. You had the conspiracy trial starting. Dr. King had been to Chicago had been to Chicago to try to organize and was met with a great deal of violence and hostility. The anti-war movement was there. Uh, you had the Democratic Convention in 1968. Uh, and you had the formation of the of a Black Panther chapter in 68 in Chicago, as well as the Young Lords, a Puerto Rican group, and the Young uh, Patriots, uh, a, a white Appalachian group. So things were very much uh, in play in Chicago. Uh, the movement was very active. And uh, in the middle of all this rose a really brilliant, uh, charismatic black leader named Fred Hampton, who grew up in the suburbs of Chicago in Maywood. His family had come to Chicago from Haynesville, Louisiana. Uh, his mother had actually babysat for Emmett Till, for Emmett Till when Mamie was working at the post office. Um, and of course, it, uh, uh, interest, interestingly enough, when Emmett Till's body was brought back to Chicago, he went to the Rainer funeral home. And when Fred Hampton was murdered in Chicago, his body also was at the Rainer funeral home. And in both instances, thousands of people went by and saw the caskets. In the case of Hampton, saw the apartment where he was murdered. Uh, as Fred gathered uh, attention and support, he very much got on the radar, not only of the Chicago police, who had raided the Panther office twice, and the FBI, who had raided it once, uh, but he also was building this coalition with brown and white people, with the Appalachian uh, people who had come up from Kentucky and West Virginia, young people who had uh, moved to Uptown in Chicago, and the Puerto Ricans who had lived, were living in Lincoln Park and also being displaced and were facing police brutality and very bad housing conditions. So Fred had the ability to organize, not just in the black community, he could organize welfare mothers, he could organize law students, uh, and he could organize people in other communities who would join in his quest for equality and, and changing the fundamental conditions um, in Chicago. So uh, at that point, uh, Fred came to one of my law partners and said, we need a people's law office. We need somebody to represent these groups because every time we go out to sell a newspaper or have a protest, we're getting arrested by the Chicago cops. So we started the people's law office and we called it that to represent many of these groups uh, that were really looking for substantial change. Uh, in the society that were oppressed. And so we started uh, with an office in Lincoln Park in Chicago. And uh, we, uh, in August, uh, Fred Hampton had been framed up for supposedly stealing, I passing out 71 bars of ice cream from an ice cream truck to kids in the neighborhood. And he got two to five years in prison for a supposed robbery. That's a lengthy charge for that. Um, for a, a crime where there's very little property damage and nobody was hurt. But that's because he was such a target and we had a very uh, politically ambitious prosecutor named Ed Hanrahan who wanted to rise to uh, eventually uh, be the mayor of Chicago, be the successor to Mayor Daley by being a tough law and order guy who at one point uh, basically called all black kids who were in gangs animals. So, and he considered the Panthers a gang. 
So anyway, that's why he got this sentence. But anyway, he came out of prison in the summer of 60. He was, he, we got him out on an appeal bond. And he came out and he spoke at the People's Church. And I was there with my law partner. And I heard this person uh, who, who had been in, in prison at, at that point for about three months come out and speak. And it really changed my life. Uh, and I was one of the spectators and my one of my law partners who was just a law student that time, Flint Taylor, was with me. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming when you start t diving into the history of the FBI and the CIA um, and their, I guess, attack on activists, you start realizing that the history books aren't really teaching what really actually happened. Um, and I'm guessing this was just a, the, the way he was targeted was just the suspect of the fact that he was speaking out and they didn't like that. Well, they, they specifically said, prevent the rise of a messiah who could unify and electrify the masses. They didn't say because somebody has a gun and is a threat, but Fred had the ability to organize and, uh, and mobilize lots of people. So they, he was specifically targeted and people all the way at the top, Hoover and his assistant were watching Chicago and were made aware of the fact that this floor plan was obtained by an FBI informant uh, and was passed on to the Chicago police. Of course, we didn't know that. Uh, I had heard Fred speak. It was it was very very powerful um, in a room, uh, and he and he and he talked about it even in that speech. I, very similar to Dr. King the night before he was killed. In this case, it was three months before Fred was killed. He, he, he even said, I believe I was born not to die in a car wreck or slipping on, sleeping on a piece of, of ice or of a bad heart, but I'm going to die to be, be able to die doing the things I was born for. I believe I'm going to die high off the people. I believe that I'm going to be able to die as a revolutionary in the international proletarian struggle. And that I hope each of you will be able to die in the struggle or you'll be able to live in it. And I think that struggle is going to come. Why don't you live for the people? Why don't you struggle for the people? Why don't you die for the people? And this is what he said uh, in August. This was three months. and But he was very powerful in the sense that he said, I went down to the prison and I heard the beat of the people. And I heard what, you know, the the anguish and also the struggles of the people in the prison that he was at. Um and he also said, uh, uh, if you ever think about me and you ain't going to do no revolutionary act, forget about me. I don't want myself on your mind. If you're not going to work for the people, if you're asked to make a commitment at the age of 20, and you say, I don't want to make a commitment at the age of 20, only because of the reason I'm too young to die. I want to live a little longer. Then you're dead already. You have to understand that people have to pay a price for peace. If you dare to struggle, you dare to win. If you dare not struggle, then damn it, you don't deserve to win. Let me say peace to you if you're willing to fight for it. And those were the kind of words that got people very excited. And actually in this talk, he had a, he said, everybody stand up. And I stood up and he said, now raise your hand, right hand and fist. And I did. And he says, now say after me, I am. And I said, I am. And then he said, a revolutionary. And at that point, I considered myself a lawyer for the people, but not necessarily uh, in the, a lawyer for the revolution, but not in the revolution. But after he said that three or four more times, I was shouting as loud as everybody else, I am a revolutionary. And it was just an example of how he could really excite people and, and motivate people. Um, so I saw, had that personal relationship with Fred and Meanwhile, following that, like I said, there was a lot of uh, the police had attacked the Panther office twice. Uh, one of the programs of the Panthers was the Breakfast for Children program. The peace police actually came in and urinated on the cereal and things that they had. Yeah, they, when the police came in, they, they at one time they set the office on fire. Another time they just destroyed everything, including showing their disdain for the breakfast program. And that was a very popular program in Chicago in which the Panthers collected food, went to the communities, uh, started cooking at 6.30 in the morning and fed breakfast to kids. And actually that program eventually was picked up by most cities and states. 
But as a Panther, you had a responsibility. You had to be there. You had to either cook or serve or talk to the kids. And it was very popular. And that was also something that J. Edgar Hoover was afraid of. He talked about attacking and destroying the Breakfast for Children program uh, because it was it, it, it was very popular in the community and uh, helped the, the Panthers organize and get support. So things were so bad. Did people, did people know about all this during when it was happening or this was all documentation that came out later? Well, yeah, the, the Panthers said went public with what had happened and that they beat the people in the office after the raid uh, and they gave their statements. And there was a, actually a progressive black newspaper called the Chicago Defender that did report some of these things as, you know, this was not just later on completely. Now, whether the you know, the larger population was as aware as it could have been, um, or whether the information was, you know, uh, poo-pooed by the uh, rain strange media, or people said, well, they're the Panthers and they have guns, so anything we, anything that can be done to them is okay. So, uh, but yes, it was documented at the time. There were pictures of it at the time. There were interviews with people at the time. So, yeah, it 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 isn't just what we dug up. So anyway, I went there on December second. The Panthers were going to buy their office because there had been so many bullet holes in it that they were getting evicted. So I saw Fred on December second and met with him. And we the money had come up, and we were they were going to buy the office. I had to go complete the paperwork on December second, and I just remember. The Panther office was on the second floor. And then I went down to the first floor and I just remember Fred waving and Pat saying to me, power to the people. And I responded the same. And two days later on December 4th, 1969, my law partner, Skip Andrew knocked on my door at six in the morning and said, and he was called, they called him chairman Fred Hampton. He said, the chairman's been killed. There was a police raid this morning and Fred Hampton was killed uh, and other people were wounded. And he said, I'm going to the morgue with the family to identify the body. And I had just seen this bigger than life person a few days before. I couldn't believe it. And I sort of started, what, what can I do? And he said, well, some of the survivors of this raid are at, are at the Wood Street Police Station. Why don't you go interview them? So on the morning of December 4th, I went and interviewed uh, the uh, the people who, the, who, there were seven, it turned out, and I heard this on the radio going, the police had come in, Mark Clark and Fred Hampton were killed, um, four people were shot, and three people were just beaten up and were at the Wood Street Police Station uh, and could talk about the raid. So when I got there, I asked to interview as a lawyer, uh, Fred Hampton's uh, fiance, eight months pregnant with their child, had been in bed next to him. And so uh, at first they said they had orders not to let any lawyer in. And I read him the code that said to interfere with a lawyer's right to talk to his client as a felony. So they reluctantly let me in. So out came Deborah Johnson, who in a nightgown, uh, a very bulging stomach, and was clearly pregnant. And I asked her what happened. And she said, well, the police came in firing. They came to the back bedroom where she was sleeping with Fred. They pulled her out of the bedroom. Uh, and one cop went in and said, is he dead yet? And then she heard two shots. And the other cop said, he's good and dead now. And that's what she reported to me that morning. Um, and also the other two people who I interviewed followed up and also backed up her story. They had been pulled out of that room. They say the police came in firing. But on my way back, I heard the, the police version was they were serving a search warrant. They didn't know who was there. And uh, unknowns to them, the Panthers opened fire on them. And th three times they was a ceasefire, but the Panthers kept firing. So that's the version the public heard because Hanrahan held that press conference that morning. So all the survivors were charged with attempted murder. Uh, four of them had been shot, in particular, the head of the 
medical program, Doc Satchel had four bullets, 45 caliber bullets in his stomach because they took a machine gun on this raid, even though they claimed they didn't know it was a Panther crib. Um, and so uh, that began the, the, the process of well, what really happened and how did it happen? And originally the police claimed they had uh, evidence that the Panthers had fired a shotgun at them as they came in. And they had a shotgun shell, which they claim matched the Panther weapon. But upon further inspection, it actually matched, matched a police weapon. And it, we learned that the police went in with a carbine, with shotguns, with handguns, and with a 45 caliber machine gun. So this was in December of 1969. Fred Jr. was born posthumously uh, three weeks later after his, his father was murdered. Um, so this started us on a first a path to get the survivors, to, to get them to drop the charges, which happened in April because all the evidence, when we, when what happened was when we, uh, we brought in an expert, uh, on, on, on firearms identification. And so for some reason, the police after the raid left the apartment vacant. And so it was a crime scene, but we got in there and one of my law partners had the had the presence of mind to bring in a filmmaker and a minister. And they went in and started filming and the walls and gathering the evidence. And then we brought in a, an expert uh, in firearms identification. And so while the police were saying they were open to fi fire, fired upon, uh, and they were coming in from the east side of the apartment. The, the Panthers' bedrooms were on the west side. And when we looked at the shots, they all came from the direction of the police uh, towards the Panthers, except one from Mark Clark, who had been at the front door. And we think it was after he was shot because his shot went straight up in the ceiling. And it was probably an involuntary shot. Uh, that's the only shot from the direction of the Panthers into the hallway ceiling. So we gathered this evidence. They dropped the charges initially, and then we filed a civil suit uh, of 1983. This was a violation of civil rights, a violation taking of life, liberty, and process without due process, without a valid search warrant, which we also discovered. And we did 12, 13 years it took us to finally get some justice, uh, a five, a, a year and a half trial. And the trial was about uncovering evidence. Uh, you get discovery in a civil case. You get to ask the police for their reports. You get to ask the FBI. And so as this progressed, uh, two things were happening. We were getting documents. And the church committee was also investigating in, in, a, in the aftermath of Watergate, to what extent had U.S. intelligence agencies breached people's personal rights? And so they were investing this COINTEL, they were investigating COINTEL Pro also, and we communicated with them. But what we discovered, and it came to us very strangely when we asked for all the relevant documents, we got a document that was a diagram of the apartment where Fred Hampton, uh, where the raid took place, complete with the furniture and the bed. It said bed where Hampton and Johnson sleep. Um, and of course, then who wrote this and what's the, where does this come from? And as we, the FBI had publicly said, well, the state, the police carried it out. We didn't really have anything to do with it. Uh, it's their issue. But what we uncovered was that floor plan was actually obtained when the control, an FBI agent uh, had a control and informant in the party named William O'Neill. And O'Neill, at the request of the FBI agent, drew this floor plan. And then they gave it to the local police with some outdated information about guns being in the apartment. And so they knew what would happen. Uh, and they wanted the police to do their dirty work. Uh, so we also discovered that they had, FBI had sent a letter to Jeff Fort, the head of the Blackstone Rangers, the Peace Donation, the largest, most well-armed gang in Chicago, 
and they'd sent him an anonymous letter, just not on FBI stationery, but a, a letter saying, I'm just a black brother, and I'm, I've been hanging out with the Panthers. Uh, they got a hit out on you, Jeff, you, Jeff Ford. I know what I'd do if, if I know what I'd do if I were you. And it was signed a black brother. So this showed that the FBI wanted someone to take out Fred Hampton. They hoped that the gangs would do it under this false idea that the, the Panthers had it out for, for Jeff Ford. Fortunately, Jeff Ford didn't go for it. He didn't believe that, and he didn't try to take revenge or anything on the Panthers. But anyway, it showed, it showed the motivation. Um, they also had done all kinds of other dirty tricks, put out racist cartoons by Students for Democratic Society to the Panthers, and made it the Panthers think that they were making fun of them. Hold and on, before we get to the racist cartoons, did they have? So they were just looking for a way to be able to go in there and kind of get rid of what they called Fred Hampton an issue, um, just looking for an excuse, and that was the threat that they had. Now this threat. Am I am I right in saying that? No, the threat was a a phony threat that the. Uh, on Jeff Ford's life, that the Blackstone that that they were they were trying to get the Blackstone Rangers to get rid of Fred Hampton. They saying he the Panthers have a hit out on you. Are you going to do anything about it? But it's not real. It wasn't real. No, it wasn't real. But they were hoping that Jeff Ford would believe it was real. They sent a similar letter to Fred Hampton, saying that the the Blackstone Rangers are out to kill you. What are you going to do about it? Neither one of them either believed it was authentic or whatever, but that showed the intent was to get someone to take Fred out to to kill him. When we asked the head of the FBI in Chicago who signed off on that letter, well, what's a hit? He said, well, a hit is a nonviolent attack, which was a joke because it's, it costs just the opposite. Um, but it took a long time to uncover this and, uh, we had a very racist judge who, you know, was made it very difficult and basically told the jury that everything we did was, or the Panthers did was illegal. And that was, they were on trial, not the police. So after 18 months of trial, when the jury was hung and couldn't reach a verdict, the judge dismissed our case and assessed costs against the plaintiffs and uh, an appeal bond. And that was a pretty down moment, I think. And if we hadn't remembered Fred talking about Dare to Struggle, uh, we didn't have any money. The transcript, 33,000 pages, would have cost would have cost thousands and thousands of dollars. <laughs> but somehow we did appeal. We won. They said we had presented more than enough evidence of a conspiracy between the feds and the state to go to a jury. And they actually were going to assess damages and said we could put into evidence the hiding of documents by the FBI as evidence of guilt, which eventually led to a settlement in 1983 uh, of $1.85 million for the survivors of the raid and the families of Mark Clark and Fred Hampton. With some of the documents that the FBI hid, was it surprising that they didn't just destroy them? Like I know from diving more into the 60s and 70s um, about the FBI's destruction of documents and also the CIA. I'm just curious why they would even try and hide those. Why wouldn't they just get rid of them? A, ve a very good question. And there, there, are two, there are two situations here that really kind of speak to that. One is, if Hoover and the people in the Washington Bureau sent out a document entitled COINTELPRO Black Panthers, uh, and even if it was about Chicago, that document would be routed to FBI headquarters in Washington, to the Chicago field office. It might be in the Black Panther file. It might be in the Fred Hampton file. It would go to many files, and each one of those documents would show the routing. So it wasn't as simple as going into Chicago and pulling out that file. You'd have had to go into five files because the one in DC would have said a copy went to Chicago, why isn't it there? So I think that paper trail uh, made it difficult if a document disappears, they're also numbering indexes. So if a, a number's not there, 
uh, it raises the question. So I think that one of the reasons was you couldn't, if you could destroy one document and there'd be no record that it existed, uh, there certainly would have been a bigger temptation. But the one document that they deliberately only made one copy of was the floor plan. And it was in a file that said, do not file file. And the US attorney, uh, the FBI said, when we asked for all the documents, they came to this guy and said, well, you know what to do. But the, it was in the aftermath of Watergate and the FBI didn't necessarily want to be, nobody particularly wanted to be the one had it destroying documents when Nixon was obviously guilty of destroying the tape and things. So this U.S. attorney, and it was almost his last act because he was fired shortly afterward, turned this floor plan over to us, uh, knowing its significance, that it was close to a smoking gun, uh, and just said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do the dirty work. And, you know, he actually has been interviewed and uh, was, you know, something of, of, of somebody who came forward, who had the guts to come forward. So that's why that document wasn't destroyed. It, it was set up so that it could be, but it wasn't. Uh, and so those are the two answers I have. Uh, for, you know, frequently documents were withheld. Frequently documents were inked out black, so you couldn't read them. And then you'd have to go back and ask that the redactions uh, be lifted and that they, you know, so it was a long process. So they'd say, we don't have it. Oh, well, okay, look again. Oh, well, we do have it, but we can't let you see all of it. And, you know, it was a, it was a long process. Uh, yeah, dealing with that Freedom of Information Act is a, not, not an easy one to work with. But when it came to the, when it came, when it came to the floor plan, could you tell if there was any other destruction to any other rooms or was it a specific like walk in the front door and head to the room that they needed to get to, to get rid of Fred Hampton? It, it, the, the floor plan, of course, didn't, it just lo was a location of where things were, including the back bedroom, back right bedroom where Hampton and Johnson would be. Uh, the police came in the front door and the back door and pretty much came in. They shot Mark Clark at the front door and they even came in the living room and, and the machine gun around this woman on the couch. And generally there was, the bullets did tend to go towards the back bedroom and towards the bed where Hampton would have been, was sleeping. Uh, and strangely enough, Fred never woke up and there were also drugs found in his system and he didn't use drugs. So there was a, a question about who could have drugged him. Uh, the informant was with him the night before, uh, and there was some evidence that he had given Fred something to drink. Uh, I don't know, but Deborah described him, even in the midst of this tremendously loud shooting, sort of lifting his head up and then putting it back down uh, as though he were in a trance or had been drugged. Uh, so, but the direction of the bullets were generally towards that uh, bedroom. But on, on the other hand, they came in the front bedroom, they were three people sleeping, they had just woken up and they, this guy emptied his machine gun, uh, hitting one person in the t four times in the chest and stomach and colon, he had to tap four bullets removed, hitting two other people in their extremities uh, there. So not everything went that, but we think not only did they come in shooting, but that Fred was actually assassinated because the bullets, what we found was two parallel bullets coming into the side of Fred's head at close range, which would match what Deborah said about they went in the bedroom and she heard two shots and then he's good and dead now. And those were the two shots that killed him. Amazingly, even though a lot of other shots came in, there was only one superficial wound that he had suffered prior to those two shots in the head. Did you look at the connections with that informant or whoever might've gave him a drink? Cause I'm thinking like, the way that this is going to be reported is when an autopsy report comes out, usually something like that, like there's drugs in a system is the thing that usually gets profitized the most or shot out there the most because it devalues kind of the whole essence of the whole thing. So I'm thinking if they drugged him, that was on purpose for that specific reason. I'm, that might just be speculation on my I part. Don't know. It was it was very controversial. The official uh, autopsy did not show drugs. Then the family asked that, that they have a private autopsy and they hired 
the person who the the coroner who did it had been a former coroner of Cook County. He found the drug uh, in Fred's body, but Fred didn't take drugs, and he had some, almost enough that would have, if not killed him, made him put him to sleep. Uh, so then the third time the FBI came back and then they claimed they didn't find anything, but that was months later and it could have uh, degenerated or disappeared. So the speculation was if he was drugged, uh, he did drink Kool-Aid or orange juice and the informant was in the apartment that night, but left before the police came. And so had the access, could have had the access to give Fred some uh, this in a cecobarbital that was found in his system uh, in some kind of drink. It's a mystery. We can't say, you know, nobody said, well, I actually remember this informant giving him this glass, but he, the informant was serving Kool Aid or some kind of drink that night, a non alcoholic drink. It's the only reason I never drink Kool Aid. I've heard way too many bad stories about Kool Aid to even pick up a glass. Okay, I guess I've st- I haven't drunk Kool Aid either in a long time. But anyways, when it comes they- to the two shots to his head, how did they explain that? They didn't make up some story like a bullet went through the wall and hit him in the head or anything. No, they, they couldn't because the cal the, the bullets came sort of if you're sleeping, you know, and somebody comes up next to your bed, they were at an angle like this way through your head. They were parallel, you know. Those would couldn't be random shots. And they came from a pistol. And one of the cops who came in, the, there was only one cop in the back who came in with a pistol. So we think that he executed Fred. Uh, the way Deborah says she was pulled out of the room, what the cop said, the bullet head, the bullets in his head. He was not just hit by a random fire, but he was assassinated after, you know, and, and, was, and was the target of the raid, at least for some of the police from the get go. Now, did it report that, though, like when it happened and everything like, I mean, you doing your own interviews and kind of diving into this and then also seeing what's being reported on the news. I mean, was it frustrating? Did it match at all or were they just overall covering up a story? I mean, it's hard to explain two shots in the head without saying it's like an execution. Well, they sort of hid that. They didn't say no cop. All the cops had to fill out firearms use reports. And the one cop who we think whose gun matched that kind of uh, uh, bullet hole filled out a report in a strange way and said, uh, did you shoot your weapon? Yes. Did you injure someone? Uh, And it said, question mark. And then it said distance from the person. And it said, oh, then it said question mark. It, it said he had hit, hit somebody, and then when they asked him how far away was he when he shot, he put a question mark there because obviously he didn't want to put 12 inches. It's like don't recall whenever someone gives a statement. Don't, don't recall. recall. Yeah, question mark. I don't know. So we pretty much, you know, you trace those bullets. You trace what Deborah told me that morning. This was not, you know, the, the fact that I'd heard it that morning from her before she knew any of that evidence and the fact that then what we found matched her story, you know, was very convincing. And I think if we hadn't had such a terrible judge who let in all bad evidence about what the Panthers had ever done anywhere and wouldn't let in the evidence about the police, but the police for a long time put up a story and Hanrahan told the Chicago Tribune and they gave them exclusive and they did a phony reenactment in which they claimed they were fired upon. The problem was the physical evidence never matched the police story that you can tell the direction of a bullet because the incoming bullet in a wall is smaller and the outgoing bullet on the other side of the wall is splayed outward. So if all the bullets are coming from the direction of the police toward the Aunt Panthers, except the one shot into the hall ceiling, you pretty much know it was not a shoot out, but a shoot in. I mean, is there a large push from just any other researchers or anyone out there that's looking more into, because I think by now we know with all the new documentation and just like the past 10, 15 years compared to back then, that they infiltrated the Black Panther Party. Hoover had his own FBI agents go in there and literally make them turn on each other. It was 
all his smart strategy to do so. So I feel like with all these deaths that happen, I, like I said, I haven't even heard of Fred Hampton before, you know, coming across your book and it's like, why don't we know about them? We know that I, mean, I think history is starting to show a little bit more of this dark side of things that went on, at least behind the scenes. But that's only because independent researchers are trying to blow the whistle on it and kind of expose, you know, a lot of this corruption that was happening because the mainstream doesn't report on it. No. And there was a curse because it was a Chicago story and it was a very political story. And the black community, when we started gathering the evidence thousands of people from the black community went through the apartment the panthers led a led a tour and they said and they said here's the shots in the front here's the shot in the middle bedroom here's the shot in the in the back room here's the trajectory so it became big news in chicago because there had been such an effort covered and the black community which was very was mixed on the panthers did not like the fact that a young 21 year old was killed in his bed at 4.30 in the morning. So they there was a demand that that, you know, sort of like when Emmett Till's body was exposed, the world wanted to know what happened to him. How could he come back and his swollen face and everything told a story of, of torture. And in this case, the apartment showed what happened in the raid. So in many ways, it, it did come out. Of course, it took a while to show the FBI role in it you know we thought well it's the police did this and they and the police didn't acknowledge that they had the floor plan they pretended like they had their own informant which turned out to be bullshit <laughs> they didn't uh but it took a long time to expose that um so and then i wrote this book the, the murder of fred hampton the assassination of fred hampton how the fbi in chicago murdered the police but I didn't write it till 40 years later. I was pretty busy as a civil rights lawyer. Um, and then, you know, that I think brought people in your generation focus back on it. And then they made a movie from what we discovered called Judas and the Black Messiah that got an Academy Award for the guy who played Fred Hampton. Uh, that told part of the story. You know, it didn't tell how it, what it took to get this information out, but it did talk about uh this uh it, it did talk about what happened and you you mentioned the role of the fbi o'neill was not just you know my theory my idea at that time very naive was an informant uh who somebody who basically kind of sits there pretends to be innocuous and takes in information and reports it o'neill was an agent provocateur he actually built an electric chair supposedly to scare informants um, he developed, he said he had a missile that they could shoot from the Panther office to City Hall. And he was encouraging other Panthers to do burglaries. So the FBI was very much into encouraging illegal activity. And then, of course, using that as a way to crack down and arrest arrest the Panthers. So they were very active. And O'Neill was, uh, you know, not a, this passive person, but actually... Uh, very active in fomenting illegality. And sometimes the FBI had a plan. They they had a fugitive who was an informant and he would go into an FBI office for a day and then he'd leave. And then they'd raid the FBI office looking for him, knowing he wasn't there. But it gave them an excuse to do these raids. When I, this is a more modern day question, but when we had those Black Lives Matter protests that were going on, do you think they use agent provocateurs in that as well too? There's a a video of a man with an umbrella and he's taking his hammer and he's just smashing store windows for no reason. And a camera person's just asking, why are you doing that? He's not showing his face. He's just doing that. I saw that. And I, I think it's very likely that that was occurring because it was senseless. It could only, it, you know, it didn't have a purpose. Its purpose was to make uh, protesters look foolishly violent or, you know, nonsensical. So I'm I'm sure they did, and and uh, they also used you know other, all kinds of of methodologies, and they did have informants, and I'm sure that they had provocateurs uh, who were there. It's just when you said that word, that's the first I've ever heard of that word being associated with anything. So I mean, it's not. I mean, 
it's a government tactic to be able to disperse something that might be peaceful. And then you look at all the civil rights protests that were going on and just people going in there, you know, trying to break that up. I mean, they were doing looking for any reason. What's interesting to me is you said something in the beginning about him being a messiah that the government document stated that he was a messiah. The, the government document was a general thing put out by Hoover before Fred was killed. And it said, among our objectives are to prevent the coalition of militant black groups to try to discredit them publicly with various news stories. And then one of the specific things was prevent the rise of a messiah who could unify and electrify the masses. And at that point, they said, uh, Malcolm X would have could have would have been such a person, except he was dead. Dr. King was alive and said, well, if he gave up his pretend uh, concern for nonviolence, they mentioned Stokely Carmichael and they mentioned one other person. They didn't specifically say who was a messiah. On the other hand, that idea, let's get rid of uh, a, a, a leader uh, that is charismatic. Uh, it was part of the same program that they got this information with the floor plan and gave it to the police and were following it. And then the other thing was, after the raid, the FBI gave the informant a bonus. And that was another document that took a long time to uncover. But they gave him credit for, quote, the success of the raid. So while the FBI publicly was denying any role, they were actually rewarding both the agent and the informant who got that floor plan and gave it to the police. Uh, they gave them bonuses. The reason why I asked that question was because Tom O'Neill wrote a book called Chaos about the Manson murders. And mm -hmm. that was it, the Helter Skelter model. Um, I don't know if you looked into that at all, but they committed perjury. Bugilosi did on the trial. He put a prosecutor on the defendant's side. They had plenty. And when I mentioned Brad Schweiber to you in email, he wrote a thing about Donald DeFries in the Patty Hearst kidnapping. That was the same situation. They mentioned that language of a messiah or these types of like, and it, to me, that's weird. And seeing that connection in that as well, too. And you start realizing how it's not the official story. There's a whole other back history to it that needs to be exposed. And you just realize it's like a term that they used in Co COINTELPRO or being able to disperse some of these um, activist groups. Yeah, well, and most recently, a uh, long time ago, when Malcolm X was murdered in in the Audubon Ballroom in public, I guess it was in 1965, I believe, uh, they immediately arrested us within a, three people, uh, and they convicted three people of his murder. And it turns out, uh, finally, there was an investigation done by the U.S. by the district attorney in New York, and two of those people. Or were totally innocent and were freed. One, unfortunately, had already had passed away, and they just got thirty-eight million dollar settlement because the case against them was was framed. They were framed up. So, yeah, that's an example. We got to find. I, I'm not saying that the. You know, I think the there's clear evidence that the FBI, for example, uh, built up the hostility between Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad and, and Malcolm X. Uh, I, I don't know that there were FBI agents who murdered Malcolm X or the FBI agents who looked the other way or just happened not to be on duty that night. You know, there are different ways that the FBI can act either directly like in Hampton or through the police or, you know, some strange things about Dr. King being killed. There was no security that night in that area. Why not, you know, was that just a coincidence? Um, well, you start so, looking in more when you find out about COINTELPRO and the dirty tricks of the FBI and the CIA, and it makes you question everything. I mean, there's a lot of like they created the Rational Observer to load up on college campuses. That was a fake newspaper, basically cutting down all these activists against the Vietnam War and telling people it's a good thing we're doing all this. And that's an FBI created magazine. And still people are finding out today that that was fake. And it's like 
yeah, it's like you don't realize everything that they're doing in the sense of keeping their own mentality. It's, and I'm not like a big like tear the government down. I probably would side more with like a libertarian view, but I'm not for this destruction of government, but I want transparency. This is wrong. And I think you need to correct that as well, too. I mean, our history books are not teaching the truth. And it's like in today's society, or is it still in people's public consciousness? Are they still thinking about it? And that's why we have people like you to thank that are still doing the work and speaking about these types types of things too because if you don't correct your history then you're going to be doomed to repeat it absolutely and and after watergate there was a reaction and congress actually passed restrictions on uh cia and fbi and what they could do and that they needed probable cause even though the two people in gerald ford's campaign cheney and rumsfeld opposed that <laughs> because years later of course they were doing their own dirty tricks around the iraq war and fake news and and everything. And you're right. If we don't penalize or punish people who do these things, and we have never have the US, we didn't do anything about the people who made the fake war in Iraq uh, and lied about it, uh, then you know it just continues, you know, and we obviously saw with Trump and his band that they could get away with anything or they thought they did. And so far they still have unfortunately have you read the 175 page intelligence report that they did during the church committee about the covert operations of the cia and fbi i have it's been a while but yes and it's, we work closely yes it's, yeah. it's it's really shocking to see so i'm glad they asked as many questions about mk ultra to be 100 percent honest with you because you find out that like 44 college and universities that were involved in a lot of these studies and things of this sort and you're just like I mean, are there fingers in everything? That's a dangerous aspect of a lot of stuff. You know, it's when you find this stuff out, it doesn't bring you comfort, but it makes you more paranoid on what else could be those types of things. Well, yeah. And, you know, we saw uh, in Ferguson, there were drones and I was a lawyer up at Standing Rock doing part of that. And so not only do you have the government acting surreptitiously, but they're even hiring private security agencies like at, 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 uh, at, at, at uh, Standing Rock, you had uh, something, you know, you had a tiger swan, which was a, created for the military in Iraq to supposedly do counterintelligence. And so energy transfer partners who own the pipeline that they wanted to build uh, hired this private firm to do security. And we know from their reports even though we haven't gotten all of them, uh, that they were dealing with the water protectors as though they were dealing with enemy combatants and talked about, uh, you know, and infiltrated them. And I know one of the, the only person up there who was really convicted of having a gun during a riot, the gun was brought there by the FBI. So there's a lot of stuff that, you know, uh, gets done by the FBI and law enforcement. And now they even use a private intelligence agency uh, to do it. You know what they say, the CIA doesn't activate on domestic land. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, I, um, that's it's in their charter that they're not supposed to. But I think we all know that they've been doing it uh, without anybody else knowing. But um, when it comes to Fred Hampton's son, do you have a relationship with his son? Do you does he know about all this? He does know about this, and he and his mother have been very active in exposing it, and they played a role in, in getting the movie done. So, yes, and his uh, when we brought the civil suit, uh, Deborah Johnson, who knows now goes by uh, Najeri, Akua Najeri, uh, was one of, was our client, you know, and so Fred absolutely knows we, my law partner Flint and I became particularly close with Fred's mother, father, brother, and sister, who in his mother and brother every year on December 4th would hold, hold an event uh, memorializing the, the murder. And we got very close with, with that family. And actually, you know, um, I went down with them once to visit the grave, Fred Hampton's grave in Louisiana. And there were bullet holes in the grave because apparently the Klan in Haynesville had shot it up some years before. When it comes to your documentation that you used for this book, um, 
I mean, are you still requesting for documents to be released? Are you, is there still things you haven't seen yet that you know um, that they probably have, but they're just not giving it up? Kind of amazingly, the answer is yes. And even though we are not, well, the, the, the requesters under FIA, there are. And they, those people uh, about a year ago, you know, 40, 50 years later, got some new documents that actually showed that the we learned for the first time that the agent got a bonus. We knew that the informant got a bonus. And it also showed a number of documents showing how closely the top people, Hoover and Sullivan in DC were following uh, the floor plan and following what was about to happen in Chicago. And they even, there's still more documents that we haven't gotten. So, and, you know, and then some of these were even redacted. Uh, there was a federal grand jury and it was clear that the federal government was supposed to get the truth. Well, they, they were very good about getting the truth about the police and who fired what shot, but they never uncovered the FBI raid uh, which obviously they knew about. And has anybody issued like a public apology or is any of these people alive to give an apology to the family? Um, there was an attempt, unfortunately, it got sort of caught up between different groups to rename a street in Chicago, Fred Hampton Way. But the city council, different factions ended up opposing that. And uh, Iberia Hampton was recognized, actually received a, from Mayor Daly's son, a note of what a significant contribution she had made. Um, and there is a, one of the things that Fred worked for early on was a swimming pool in Maywood. There was no place where black kids could go to school. Uh, they closed the pool in Maywood rather than be integrated. Um, and so he led marches to the city hall demanding a recreation center. And now there is the Fred Hampton Mech Recreation Center in Maywood with a swimming pool and other facilities. Um, but I'm, I regret years later that in addition, we didn't, in addition to get money, get an apology and a recognition of the city's role and the police role and the federal role in, in the murder of Fred. Yeah, I don't know about if they're ever going to apologize. I mean, you look at the history of the FBI. I don't think they have a track record of doing that at all. Um, but I'm glad people like you are able to at least voice and you know tell people like myself who might not have heard of Fred Hampton. And um, where can people find your book, man? I really appreciate the time you gave me to tell about tell me about his story. Well, anywhere. I mean, I encourage people to go to their local bookstore that may have it uh, or can order it. And of course, it's on Amazon and, and all the other places. Uh, you know, it's 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 pretty well, it sold over 50,000 copies, I think partly because with the rise of Black Lives Matter, a lot of young people were really interested in what happened to Fred Hampton as they learned about it. And then with the movie, Judas and the Black Messiah, there's a, a renewed interest. Uh, so it's not, you can get it, you can get it on audio books. You can get it, as I said, from, you know, Borders or Amazon or any of the booksellers or your local bookstore. You can, uh, they can order it if they don't have it. And do you have any links you'd like to promote like a Twitter or anything? Um, no, I, I, uh, I would like you, people can go and, and, uh, I should have that and I have had it in the past, but I don't have a Twitter account right now. Uh, so I am somewhat active uh, on Instagram uh, under my name and do do updates sometime, Jeffrey Haas. Uh, and you can also uh, Google me and, and, and uh, find out more about me and about the book. I'm going to link all your links in the description, Mr. Haas. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. And thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blind.